Uh, is the Qur'an a creation or is it an existence? Was it, did it pre-exist? Okay, so again, uh, there is divine speech which is uncreated and which certainly exists and necessarily exists. But this is an attribute of God. And it is an attribute of God, as you have heard many times now, which is extremely similar to knowledge itself, to omniscience. Uh, knowledge simply manifests and speech points. Speech yadul, it indicates that thing. But they are about the same thing. The infinite multiplicity of all the things God knows with no multiplicity in God. His knowledge is one. His knowledge manifests itself in all those things that are known, but there is no plurality like that in God. This is why unicity is the secret of secrets. The absolute oneness of God is the greatest secret of all. And he has a speech which is also a speech of unicity that perfectly indicates all things that is known without sound, without language, without letter, without composition, without temporality. This is his attribute. Then God creates speech that reflects that which he knows and that about which he speaks. You have the tablet, the lower, <coughs> you know, the tablet of light in which God writes his decree. The angels write it. And if the, all the trees were pins and all the oceans were seas, they would be exhausted before the words of God would be exhausted. But that's talking about the created word, the word that is language, the word that is composition, the word that is written by the angels. They write it in time and space. And it perfectly reflects what is unwritten. And it is a multiplicity that is so great that if all the oceans were ink and all the trees were pins, the oceans would be, existed, would be exhausted before it's ever written. Okay? But the speech that it writes about is not like that. The speech it writes about is utterly one. Okay? And these are amazing things. These are amazing truths. And um, so, and the Qur'an, which is revealed by God, is revealed in perfect language, beautiful language. We said in the first night that we were here that the Arabic language is extremely ancient. You know, the, the, the family it belongs to is called Afro-Asian. Used to be called Hamidic Semitic. But in that family, which is a big family, Hebrew, Aramaic, Ethiopic, um, ancient Egyptian, Coptic, Berber, Somali, Hausa, um, many tongues. In that family, which has been studied very carefully, the most ancient of the languages in it is Arabic. It's right there with, you could take Thamudic also, it's very ancient. The language of Thamud, which is written in the deserts of Arabia. You know, but Arabic is extremely ancient. It was preserved by the Arabian Peninsula. No invaders could come. The Arabian Peninsula is, is, an, is an amazing uh, creation. And then it was also preserved by the pilgrimage that was instituted uh, by Abraham. So the pilgrimage keeps the tribes, the sacred months and so forth, uh, it, keep, it enables them to live together despite the fact they have no government, they have no king. <laughs> that God made the Kaaba, the house of God, and the sacred man. He made it Qiyaman Linnas, with Shahr al Haram, and the sacred months, or the sacred month. Okay, this is true. It's like they don't have a king, but they have the Kaaba, and they have the sacred month, and Al Hadi, Wal Qala'id. And they have the sacrificial animals that are being sent to Mecca 
and the qala'id, the garlands that are on them. Because the pre-Islamic Arabs, they honored that. They preserved the rites of pilgrimage and they preserved the sacred months, which were one third of the year. So no fighting, no war. And uh, they kept that very faithfully. Many of the early commentators, you see that in Tabari, they say that a man would meet in the sacred months the man who killed his father or the man who killed his brother, but he would not touch him. And Allah preserved that also because if they violated the sanctity of the house or the month, he retaliated. Because this had to be kept that way. And this is also what kept the Arabic as one, Arabic language as one language. Because Arabs from Hadramaut and from the Yemen and from Bahrain and from the east and Nejd and the north, they can all come to the pilgrimage. And they will speak. They have their different modes of speaking, but they understand each other. They intermarriage, intermarry. They're able to make peace with each other. This is amazing. You can talk for hours about that. So the Arabic language is ancient, and this is very important. Whenever we find ancient languages, like Sanskrit, Greek is pretty old, but it's not as old as Sanskrit. You know, uh, ancient languages are very pure, and they're extremely exact, and they're very rich. Arabic is a fantastic example. You've looked at Lisan al-Arab, right? It's a big dictionary. It's all the language of the Qur'an and the Hadith and that first generation. And how many words do you understand when you read that? I know you know Arabic better than I do. You know, but it has words in it that like, we even take sometimes the pre-Islamic poetry and if we've not been trained, it's like, what are these words? You know, and they're very exact words, very precise words. And language and thought go together. If you have a powerful language, you'll also have very powerful thought. So what were these people? What kind of people were these? And all ancient languages are like that. I would say that ancient languages are superior to modern languages. And many people would disagree on that. They would say, no, you can't make that distinction. That's prejudice on your part. But ancient languages are extremely rich. Even if we take the English language, if you go back to Saxon that was spoken in the days of the Prophet, extremely beautiful language, rich language, expressive language, 30 names of God, names of the devil, you know, names about almost everything in our vocabulary in Islam. Al-Ajal, for example, you've got it there in Saxon. Al-Sa'id, Al-Shaqid, you've got it there in Saxon, exactly. So what does that tell about human beings? It's very, very interesting. In other words, these human beings in the past, what kind of people were they? If they spoke a language that I myself am not even the equal to using. You know, these were not backward people. These were people that were pure human. And also when we study primitive religion, primitive religions all believe in one God. They're not animistic. The great studies that were done by that, by Wilhelm Schmidt in the 20th century. We talked about that the first day. And this is why people like Toynbee, he says that the most advanced human being was Paleolithic human being. That human beings of the old stone age, which ends around 7000 BC, he said they were the best of all. He said, and why? Because look at language. Look at primitive religion, things like But he said they were not builders. They were not makers of cities. They were hunter-gatherers. They were people who lived very materially simple lives, but they were the best people of all. Toynbee, that's one of a very important part you know, of his uh, study of history. And uh, we say about that, ثُلَّةٌ مِنَ الْأَوَّلِينَ وَقَلِيلٌ مِنَ الْآخِرِينَ Again, cognitive frames. You see, you get the cognitive frame of evolution, which maybe we can talk about tomorrow, and then primitive is backward. The further back you go, the stupider you become. You know, people are just cavemen, they don't know anything. And we make cartoons about that. And we draw pictures, pictures of things we never saw. We were never there. You know, there, there were types of humanoids that we found in the fossil record. We're not related to any of them. 
And, you know, we usually have a skull here and a skull there. You know, we don't know what was there in the past. And, you know, if we are scientific people and honest people, we will avoid judgment about things that we don't know. But we don't tend to do that. We have cognitive frames that paint the whole picture, and then you get the artist to come in, and he shows you how the human being was bent over an ape-like, and then he stands up and so forth. That's, that's an artist's imagination. Nothing scientific about that. And we're not even related to those people. So Arabic is an ancient tongue and a beautiful tongue. And the letters embody the meanings of the word. Qaf. Well, Quran al Majid. Qaf. You know, the letter Qaf has secrets. One of them is consolation. The letter Qaf has the power of consolation. And, you know, these, these letters then make these beautiful words. And you have that in Arabic, and you have that in the whole family of Afro-Asian languages. You had it in ancient Egyptian, the same thing. You know, so it's powerful language. Really beautiful language. And then the Qur'an comes into that. Arabic is the perfect vehicle to receive this message and to point to the uncreated speech. Umar would say, if I lose a camel's halter, I can find it in the Qur'an. And what surah in the Qur'an talks about camel's halters? But what he means is that all the knowledge of God is here. All the will of God is here. It's just I have to be able to understand it. I have to be able to relate to it. And, you know, we ask Allah to give us that ability to really love the Qur'an. And I, I know Egyptians are, are especially gifted in that. That's my belief. That um, Egyptians have... A, a relation to the Qur'an, you know, which is really profound. And I mean, any, many of the people here too, like when they come to me, they talk about the Qur'an. You can see these are people who really love it. They listen to it. They think about it. But it's an amazing book. And, and it is an eternal, you know, miracle. So there is then the uncreated speech of God. And then there is the created speech of God. And there is the created speech of God that points to the uncreated speech of God. And that's what the Qur'an does. And this is why we have lots of adab when we talk about the Qur'an. Um,